From a and &E, this is Biography. For November 26, 2001, Biography with Star Jones. In the independent feature Prozac Nation, Jessica Lange plays the mother of a young woman with clinical depression. The film is a far cry from her early work in such mainstream fare as King Kong. But for Lange, success has never been measured at the box office. Instead, it is gauged by the integrity and passion she brings to her work. You have said the secret word and you qualify for a ride in my new convertible. Come on, sweet boy. Something a little extra with Jessica, seductive. She makes a man feel like a man. Jessica can register tremendous heat. <laughs> she, is, she is a very passionate woman. There is an air of mystery about her. She always has some kind of secret or something that keeps you wanting to get to know her more. Her beauty catapulted her to fame, and her relationships with fascinating and talented men captured the public's imagination. She's had Mikhail Baryshnikov and Sam Shepard. They are two of the great sexy males of the 20th century, so <laughs> she got them both. But Jessica Lange is much more than an object of desire. She is an award-winning actress who fought to win the respect of her peers and an independent woman who chose to live life on her own terms. She runs the show, doesn't let the show run her. Jessica Phyllis Lang was born on April 20th, 1949, in the tiny lumber town of Cloquet, Minnesota. She was the third of Al and Dorothy Lang's four children. Her mother was a good-natured woman who took pride in her role as a Midwestern homemaker. I describe her as a typical Minnesotan, <laughs> somebody that holds the family together, uh, always there, you know, to cook the meals, uh, have the cookies when the uh, kids come home from school. <laughs> Jessica's father was a restless, volatile man who dreamed of something greater than small-town life. He moved from job to job, working as a traveling salesman, a Ford dealer, and a gym teacher. The family was uprooted constantly, and Jessica yearned for the security of a permanent home. I think her family member around really bothered her. You know, you, you want to stay put. I mean, it scares you when you're a child. You don't like change. Jessica was always the new kid at school, and her brother and sisters became her only playmates. The little girl became increasingly withdrawn as she and her siblings were forced to contend with their father's abrupt mood swings brought on by his heavy drinking. Having an alcoholic father, you distance yourself from that. You look for ways to get away from it because alcoholic behavior is unpredictable. You never know what the person's going to be like. And Jesse did that. Eight-year-old Jessie found an escape through drawing and reading. She loved romantic novels like Wuthering Heights and Gone with the Wind. She would um, uh, read the Margaret Mitchell novel again and again. Then she saw Gone with the Wind at a very young, very impressionable age, and it zonked her. The quiet and reserved child admired spirited heroines like Scarlett O'Hara, and would reenact her favorite scenes alone in her bedroom. Jessica was also an A student who devoted hours to her studies, trying to please her demanding father. I think she adored him, I mean, loved him very deeply, but I, I think also was probably very fearful of him because he was a big, powerful, you know, presence. Her father pushed her just to be her best and to do something important. In 1963, Jessica entered Detroit Lakes High School. Now a tall, striking blonde, she attracted plenty of attention, but chose to keep to herself, focusing on her grades and a growing interest in art. She was shy, she was withdrawn. Most high school kids are just interested in flirtations and uh, sporting events. She was already beyond that. Jessie would like to read, was well aware of world affairs, and socially concerned. During her junior year, 
Jessica was convinced by one of her few close friends to try out for the school play. She won the lead in the melodrama Love Rides the Rails and was surprised by how confident she felt on stage. Just came kicking and screaming into the play. She took to uh, acting very, very fast, even as she had a flair for the dramatic. But just as Jessica began to feel at home, her family moved back to Cloquet, and the 16-year-old transferred to the local high school. There she kept busy with extracurricular activities such as writing for the school paper and decorating the gym for dances. Jessica always hoped her accomplishments would impress her father, but she felt pressured by his expectations and longed to break free from the confines of small town life, just as he had. In 1967, she won an art scholarship to the University of Minnesota. Although the college was only a few hours away, to Jessica, it was a doorway to the world. The freshman was excited to enter the heady atmosphere of a university, but she was even more impressed by a 26-year-old visiting Spanish photographer named Paco Grande. Jessica was fascinated by his extensive knowledge of art and culture, and soon they began a passionate affair. Imagine if you're from Minnesota and you've been there most of your life and this glamorous Spaniard walks into your lives, this handsome man uh, from another country. I mean, that's pretty exotic. That would be pretty exciting. After only a few months, 19-year-old Jessica dropped out of school to join Paco on a globe-trotting adventure. Her first stop was New York City and the infamous Chelsea Hotel, a rundown hangout for artists and writers. She and Paco then took off for Europe, where they lived with flamenco gypsies in Spain, drove a motorcycle to Amsterdam, and talked politics in the cafes of Paris. Surrounded by free-thinking bohemians, Jessica embraced her new and unconventional lifestyle. I was working as a cameraman for French television, and I met her, and I was struck by what the French call le bien dans sa peau, the comfort that she has in her body, her naturalness. That was the most striking thing you know, mixed with a kind of bohemian spirit. Low on cash, but not ready to settle down, Jessica and Paco returned to the U.S. and embarked on a two-year cross-country road trip. But in 1970, Paco was busted for marijuana possession, and his lawyer suggested that he and Jessica marry to help him appear more respectable in court. On July 29th, the couple wed in a small ceremony at her parents' home. They moved to the artist's enclave of Soho in Manhattan, where their loft became a gathering place for Paco's avant-garde friends. But after the life-changing exploits of the past three years, Jessica was hungry for something more. He was the artist, and uh, although she was assisting him and enjoying herself, there had to come a time when she said, I want to be the artist. Uh, she had too much talent and creativity and brains to not feel that way sooner or later. Jessica went back to her painting and joined a modern dance troupe, but wasn't inspired by either pursuit. Then she saw Marcel Carnet's film Children of Paradise, starring Jean-Louis Barral as a brilliant mime. For Jessica, the expressive performance art was a revelation. She immediately made up her mind to move to France, where she could study with 76-year-old Etienne de Creux, the man who had trained Barral and the world-famous Marcel Marceau. Even though she spoke no French and had only $300 to her name, 21-year-old Jessica packed her bags and went to Paris alone, leaving her relationship with Paco up in the air. She was a nonconformist and a very free spirit. I mean, the very active uprooting yourself and going to Paris is not your typical act. Jessica trained intensely, worked as a street performer and artist model, and reveled in the freedom of life on her own. But after two years, she began to feel limited by the silent art form. And in 1973, Jessica returned home to the States. Back in New York, she was reunited with Paco, but quickly realized their relationship had run its course. 
The couple went their separate ways, though neither bothered to file for divorce. The 24-year-old moved into a tiny Greenwich Village apartment and waited tables at night to pay the rent. She also capitalized on her looks by signing on with the Wilhelmina Modeling Agency. She reluctantly agreed to do it because I don't think she thought modeling was very creative. Uh, it was creative for the photographer, but not for the model. You just had to stand there and look gorgeous. Jessica missed the excitement of performing and decided to give acting a try. What attracted her initially to acting was the cathartic quality because she had so much inside of her to get out. And you can only get out so much through mime. She enrolled at the highly regarded Herbert Berghoff studio, where she took classes from Warren Robertson. From the, the beginning, Jessica was going to be an actress. I mean, she was attentive, she studied, she really applied herself. She had that focus. In 1975, producer Dino De Laurentiis was looking for an unknown blonde to play the lead in his $25 million remake of the film classic King Kong. De Laurentiis was impressed with Lang's sensuality and powerful screen presence. He quickly offered her not just the part, but a six-figure, seven-year contract as well. Jessica was overwhelmed. She was now making more money than anyone she had ever known and was whisked away to Hawaii to begin filming with co-star Jeff Bridges. She was a beatnik. She uh, had come from Europe, was involved with street theater there and mime and this sort of thing. I thought, wow, this girl is awful hip. How is she going to play this blonde bimbo? At the age of 26, Jessica Lange had landed her first big movie role, but she was completely unprepared for the impact it would have on her life. You're watching Fabulous Females Week, here on Biography. Dino De Laurentiis and Paramount Pictures present the most exciting original motion picture event of all time. King Kong. In 1976, Dino De Laurentiis launched a massive PR campaign to promote King Kong, and the movie's star, Jessica Lange, was at the center of the media blitz. You know, maybe my luck has changed. With Jeff Bridges, Charles Grodin, and introducing Jessica Lange as the beauty who charmed the beast. King Kong. She first hit the public consciousness. It was almost precisely the same time that Farrah Fawcett did, and a number of other beautiful young blonde women Jessica did not want to be thought of in that light. Lang was uncomfortable with the empty-headed blonde image De Laurentiis was creating for her. She had treated the role as a serious acting challenge, using her training as a mime to play opposite a non-existent 40-foot co-star. You almost believe that, the, that that big, huge monkey was real, you know, the way she uh, had so much uh, conviction. The highly publicized King Kong was finally released on December 17th, and the critical response was brutal. Jessica was incensed when many reviewers dismissed her as just another talentless model-turned-actress. She was treated as this fluff, this bimbo, this person not to be taken seriously, so that it both launched her career and it also somehow branded her in a way that she would have to live down. Jessica feared that her career might be over before it had begun. But the determined 27-year-old still believed in her own potential. She returned to New York to study her craft and to prove the critics wrong. She immediately came back and applied herself right away. There was no victimization in her at all. Although Lang's acting was not making any news, her romantic life kept her in the headlines. At one of Dino De Laurentiis's parties, Jessica had met famed Russian ballet dancer Mikhail Baryshnikov. Neither spoke the other's language, but they communicated well enough in French to hit it off, and soon they were deeply in love. I had a real tempestuous relationship. I think a lot of fun, but, you know, was, they 
let out a lot of emotions. She would be so flabbergasted, just frustrated with Misha sometimes because if they'd have fights or arguments, he would pretend he didn't understand anything she was saying and it would be so annoying to her. But deep down, I think she found it very funny and clever on his part. The couple was often kept apart by Barishnikov's touring schedule and Jessica found herself in a committed but non-exclusive relationship. I think it was open to an extent to that that it was the don't ask, don't tell kind of openness. And, you know, young and vibrant people all around, so there were tendencies to be affairs. Attracted to talented and intelligent men, Jessica had a fling with Broadway choreographer and film director Bob Fosse. The two remained friends, and in 1979, she made a brief appearance as the seductive angel of death in his musical, All That Jazz. The small role failed to reignite her career. Lang managed to line up auditions for major films such as Martin Scorsese's Raging Bull and Jack Nicholson's Going South, but she was devastated when the roles went to other actresses. She wanted those parts and did not get them. That had to be very, very, very tough on her. Uh, she didn't give up. She refused to fail. By 1980, Jessica had only added a little scene comedy to her resume, and she and De Laurentiis mutually agreed to cancel her contract. She tried to honor that seven-year contract, but realized it was only going to lead to more King Kongs, and that she would rather not work than to do another film like that. That year, Lang was delighted when Jack Nicholson suggested her for the lead in his next project, a remake of the film noir classic the Postman Always Rings Twice, directed by Bob Rafelson. Jack had um, remembered her from going south, and that there was a um, quality to her, and that she's, she's got such an earthy quality. When her name came up for Postman, she got the part. Jessica worked with acting coach Sandra Seacat to develop the complex role of Cora, a frustrated housewife involved in a dangerous affair. The real thing that she wanted was to play women that have real depth and are, are a challenge and are something that she can resonate with. Women that are, have intelligence and strength and maturity and passion. Point, I thought we had some. You just don't know what it's like to be a woman trapped in this kind of... You don't, you don't know. There's always a way, Carl. Lang took a gritty, unglamorous approach to the part, dressing down and wearing little makeup, but her sex appeal was undeniable. She's shuffling around in a house dress and smoking, but she has an ability to sort of let go in a role. <laughs> to let her body do what it wants to do. All right, come on, huh? Which is very exciting. Come on. Bastard! Don't come near me. You're scum, Frank. <laughs> I knew that when I met them. You'll never change. The 31-year-old actress was so focused on her work she rarely socialized between takes. Jessica's such an in, intensely dedicated actress that when she's working, she doesn't always have time for just chit-chat. And, you know, when you're young and start, you know, there was so much to prove, you had to protect that talent and make sure it's all going where it's supposed to go on the screen. Before shooting had wrapped, copies of the unedited footage circulated throughout Hollywood and Jessica's steamy performance was the talk of the town. Word was spreading about the actress's private life as well. After production, Jessica announced she and Mikhail Baryshnikov were expecting a child. Still legally married to Paco Grande, Lang shrugged off reporters' questions about her decision not to divorce before having another man's baby. She's not the conformist in any way. Uh, she's extremely open and uh, extremely intelligent, so no apologies. On March 5, 1981, Jessica gave birth to Alexandra Barishnikov, 
nicknamed Shura. Jessica took primary responsibility for raising their daughter. She wanted Shura to have as normal an upbringing as possible, away from Hollywood and surrounded by family. Jessica herself was homesick for the Midwest and used her postman paycheck to buy 120 acres in Holyoke, Minnesota and built a cabin there. She's very close to her family, her, her parents and her sisters and her brother, very, very bonded. At some point, she became aware that, that this is where her roots are. At the age of 31, Jessica Lang was preparing to settle down, unaware that her personal life and career were about to take her in surprising new directions. You're watching Jessica Lang, part of Fabulous Females Week on Biography. In 1981, Jessica Lang was beginning to move beyond her screen image as a blonde ingenue, thanks to her searing performance in The Postman Always Rings Twice. That year, she was offered the lead role in a film based on the life of Frances Farmer, the outspoken actress who was vilified for her left-wing beliefs and spent years suffering from alcoholism and mental illness. Jessica had been aware of her tragic story since the 1970s when she worked with acting teacher Warren Robertson on scenes from Farmer's autobiography. Once I suggested these Francis scenes, I mean, she devoured them. Jessica was full of all those exciting passions that are fun to portray, but not a lot of fun to live with, I don't think. Lang was convinced she was up to the challenge of portraying the troubled and volatile farmer and signed on to star in Francis. Really, I don't even look good in a bathing suit, honest. I'm not the glamour girl. What has all this got to do with acting? I think there's a lot of the rebel in Jessica Lange and that part of Frances Farmer appealed to her. There was a kind of anti-Hollywood animus in Frances Farmer as there has been in Jessica Lange. She wanted to do things her own way. Do you expect me for one moment to believe that you have greater insight into my personality than I do? Besides, I don't want to be what you want to make me. In what's that? Dull, average, normal. Jessica completely submerged herself in the part, capturing Farmer's physical mannerisms and emotional pain. Come on, get your clothes on. You've got no right! You've got no right! Come on, you're in the rest. Just uncanny. It was as though there was a... Francis' spirit had come into her, you know, in, in, a, in a great performance way. Though Jessica was often drained by the experience of playing such a self-destructive character, she resolved not to let it affect the time she spent with her daughter. She was always a wonderful mother, and it didn't make any difference how difficult the scene was after the meal. Jessica spent that lunchtime with Shura, and was totally into Shura. But as the production continued, Jessica found herself drawn to her co-star, Pulitzer Prize winning playwright, Sam Shepard. I could just tell the way her voice would change a little bit when she would discuss that very interesting playwright. <laughs> it was a complete pain to get them both into the makeup chair. And not, they were constantly on just rehearse. But past the organic, you know, physical attraction, I think that there was a very deep attraction to just who the other person was. Anybody would be attracted to Sam, I would think. <laughs> he's a very intelligent human being, a very sweet person first. And then he's um, so talented. And on top of that, he looks great. He has a look like a pioneer, and that's very exciting. Maybe not for everybody, but I certainly would be for Jessica. But just as Jessica's new romance began to heat up, she was sued for divorce by estranged husband, Paco Grande, who also demanded alimony payments. The court sided with Grande, who was losing his sight, and Jessica reluctantly paid an undisclosed amount to a man she hadn't seen in years. Exhausted by months of legal wrangling and the taxing experience of playing Francis Farmer, Lang was ready for a change of pace. She agreed to co-star in director Sidney Pollack's Tootsie, a light-hearted comedy 
about a struggling actor who poses as a woman to land a job on a soap opera. Appearing with Terry Garr and Dabney Coleman, Jessica portrayed Julie, Dustin Hoffman's bewildered love interest. Lang was confident in her abilities as a dramatic actress, but was initially intimidated to be working opposite some of Hollywood's top comedic performers. She came back in from the first day working on the set, and she closes the door and throws me. She goes, I'm not funny. Everybody's funny but me. I'm not funny. I'm, I'm going to die in this movie. And Sydney talked with her and, and calmed her down and, and made her realize that she was great and what she was doing was terrific. Dorothy? Julie, Dorothy? Dorothy? Oh, my God! Let me explain. No, no, please don't say anything. But there's a reason. Uh, I understand the no, reason. No, 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 that reason's not the reason. See, I'm not the person you think I am. I just... Wait a minute now. Nobody is. Easy. Dorothy, it's me. No, it's me. No, it's me. I'm sure I've got the same impulse as me. Obviously, I did have the same don't impulse. Don't just the conclusions about that impulse, Julie. If you could just see me out of these clothes, I... No, 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 no. The movie would not have been the movie without Jessica, I don't, I don't think. I, I don't think... There are many people who could have brought to that part the magic that was totally necessary for people to care about their relationship. You know, Dorothy, I just can't see you anymore. You know, I just feel that it would be leading you on. It wouldn't be fair to you. I really love you, Dorothy, but I can't, I can't love you. She's a damn good actress. And then on top of it, you got all that extraordinary beauty. And she's an earthy Minnesota girl. She's both ethereal and earthy at the same time. It's a hard combination. Both Tootsie and Francis were released in the winter of 1982. Lang received rave reviews for her wildly different portrayals. The fact that she played these two incredibly different roles, that's what makes Hollywood take notice. The 33-year-old was stunned when both performances led to Oscar nominations, one for Best Supporting Actress in Tootsie and a Best Actress nod for Frances. One of the first categories announced at that year's ceremony was for Best Supporting Actress, and the Oscar went to Jessica Lange. When they call her name for a Best Supporting Actress for Tootsie, there's sort of a bittersweet moment. She was grateful and very happy about it, but I think she knew she wasn't going to walk away with a big prize that night. The Best Actress Award went to Meryl Streep for her work in Sophie's Choice. But there was no doubt that Jessica had finally won the respect she craved. Just seven years after her disastrous debut in King Kong, she had finally emerged as a major acting talent and a star. For the first time in her career, Jessica Lange was calling the shots. In 1983, 34-year-old Jessica Lange had successfully relaunched her career and was about to make some dramatic changes in her personal life as well. She and Mikhail Baryshnikov had always had an open relationship, but Jessica knew her feelings for Sam Shepard were more than a passing infatuation. Shepard had left his wife, and Jessica knew it was time to make a clean break from Barishnikov. It was still very heartbreaking for both of them, I think, when they split up, because there was a, there was a deep love there as well, and they, had a, they shared a child. But it didn't have the, I think, the level of intensity that she had with Sam. Jessica and Sam moved to a secluded ranch in New Mexico. There she became involved in a cause that had first concerned her as a teenager. Back at the area that she came from in northern Minnesota, she went to school with uh, young men and women whose parents had lost their farms. Corporate farming was taking over. And these kids are coming to school having lost everything. And there's a social conscience with uh, Jessica. We're flat broke, Gail. That's what we're talking about. I know what about. we're talking about. You don't think I don't goddamn know what we're talking about? Well, I don't hear you say you're going to fight it. In 1984, Lang produced and starred with Shepard in Country, the story of a family fighting to hold on to their land. All I have to do is get a court order to have your machinery transported to another county for a legitimate auction. And that's exactly what we're going to do. 
do, Mrs. Ivy. Mister, you can take our equipment. Tomorrow you can come out here and you can haul off all our stock. But when you come out to pull us off this land, you better come with more than a piece of paper. Because we're safe. We're safe. Country drew admiring reviews and earned Jessica her third Oscar nomination. The following year, she was up for Best Actress again for her performance as country singer Patsy Cline in Sweet Dreams. Although Jessica went home empty-handed, she remained one of the most sought-after actresses in Hollywood. Lang was still committed to playing challenging roles particularly in projects that would allow her to work with Sam. In 1986, she starred opposite him in Crimes of the Heart, and two years later, appeared in his directorial debut, Far North, featuring Charles Durney. They're both professionals, and they're both very determined, and they're both very, I wouldn't say stubborn, but they, are, they know what they want. And uh, it's delightful to watch. A little scary, but sometimes, because they would get heated. Only about what the work was, nothing about anything else. By 1988, Jessica and Sam were living on a horse farm in Virginia with Shura, their two-year-old daughter, Hannah, and infant son, Samuel Walker. The unconventional 39-year-old saw no need for a marriage license, although she was a very traditional mother. Her children have always come first. As much as she loves being an actress, she loves being a mother more. She wanted her children to be near the rivers and the, the hiking and the canoeing and, and just the great outdoors. Jessica and the kids also enjoyed spending time with her parents in Minnesota. But during one of these stays, her father Al suffered a stroke and died a few weeks later. Over the years, Jessica had grown closer to her dad and was hit hard by the loss of the man who had instilled in her his own desire to get the most out of life. It was very hard on her when her father died. He was such a big part of her life. Early on in her career, so many of her performances were to prove to her father that she could do it. She pushed to get to that mark of achievement that he set. She was always proud to make him proud. During the early 1990s, Lang continued to win accolades for her work in such films as Men Don't Leave, and Music Box, which earned her a fifth Academy Award nomination. She was most excited, however, by a starring role in Blue Sky, a semi-autobiographical film written by Rama Stagner. Jessica starred opposite Tommy Lee Jones and Powers Booth, playing a sexy but emotionally unstable army wife whose longing for glamour and excitement almost destroys her family. God, don't. Hey, don't Ronnie, cut it out. You're a big girl. This is not the end of the world. No, it's just the same goddamn world that we had in Washington, only it's worse. Look at everything that was on the right. I sometimes feel like she just channeled my mother. She brought something extra she brought herself because she's so incredibly, you know, sexy and so dynamic. This girl's a real dynamo, Major. If you harness her energy, we won't need reactors. I've never worked with any actor that was more prepared, more giving, and more willing to explore the work than, than Jessica Lange. Carly in Blue Sky was very self-obsessive. Uh, not a great mother, terrible wife, and somehow she's redemptive, the way Jessica plays her. You forgive her all these things. Jessica was extremely proud of her work in Blue Sky, but the film's distributor, Orion Pictures, fell into bankruptcy before the movie could be released, and it was shelved indefinitely. She was devastated because it was such a great performance. You know, imagine doing all that work, tremendous work, and for it not to be seen is the biggest travesty. Lang did reach a wide audience when she took a supporting role in Martin Scorsese's highly successful thriller, Cape Fear, starring Nick Nolte and Robert De Niro. She re-teamed with De Niro in the gritty urban drama, Night in the City, 
playing a tough bar owner with a soft spot for a lovable loser. You shouldn't go up your drink, Harry. What are you, my mother? Not yours. Jessica told me that when she came to New York, she worked at night as a barmaid in the, in the neighborhood that way we should. And she knew the character in and out because the owner's wife and the boss she worked in was very, very similar to the character of Helen in our scripts. She just nailed that character. Come on out with me. Come on. Lay low. Boom, boom, cool out. You need to buy some time, Harry. I'm so tired of running, Helen. Stop. Give me a kiss. Up to now, Jessica had always had her pick of choice leading roles, but at the age of 41, she realized it would become increasingly difficult for her to be selective. There's a double standard of aging in Hollywood. Men go on and on, but traditionally women have not even been able to play past 35 or 40. I think Jessica Lange has suffered like all women in Hollywood. Harry, I don't want you, you know, you're 40 or so in Hollywood. You're just something that just crawled out from under a garbage can. That to an intelligent thinking woman, actress, that would be a tough pill to swallow. You're watching Fabulous Females Week here on Biography. And started to look for challenges elsewhere. She made her Broadway debut as the aging Southern belle Blanche Dubois in a revival of Tennessee Williams' A Streetcar Named Desire, opposite Alec Baldwin and John Goodman. Making the jump from screen to stage proved difficult for Jessica, who struggled to learn the art of projecting her naturally soft and breathy voice. Lang was disappointed when New York reviewers panned her performance, though the harsh critiques only spurred her on. She continued to learn and improve, playing to packed houses for 137 performances. This is how Jessica starts out everything. She's always an uphill climber. As opposed to letting the critics crumble you, she got that old Minnesota resolve going again and just marched on. And she found a way to make the character work. In 1994, Jessica received news that the nearly forgotten film, Blue Sky, was scheduled for a small, unheralded release. She hoped the movie might find an audience, but never expected what would happen next. Blue Sky was enthusiastically embraced by critics who praised Jessica's performance as fierce and gripping. That year, she received her sixth Oscar nomination. And the Oscar goes to Jessica Lang in Blue Sky. I want to thank the Academy so much. This is such a wonderful honor, especially for a little film that seemed to have no future. And uh, it's just such a great honor. I want to thank uh, Orion Films, past and present. <laughs> and last of all, to my three children, <laughs> who um, make all of this possible with their love and patience. So thank you very, very much. That was the grand prize. I mean, she loved having a Best Supporting Oscar, but she really wanted the one for Best Actress. When she won, I think she could breathe a sigh of relief. Over the next several years, Lang continued to star in a series of films that allowed her to portray strong women, but her acting career was not her first concern. In 1996, the health of Jessica's 83-year-old mother began to fail. Jessica and her family moved full-time to a farmhouse outside of St. Paul, Minnesota, where she cared for her mother until her death in 1998. She was extremely sad and she took a long time off. She spent just hours upon hours every day working in the garden and I think that helped her a lot. 
but she's an actress, you know. The urge comes back again, and she wants to do something. Although still grieving, Jessica was ready to get back to work. She returned to the screen as a plain and vengeful French spinster in a film adaptation of Honoré de Balzac's classic novel, Cousin Bet. Promise me you'll take care of them, Bet. I promise I'll take care of them. I'll take care of them all. It's always surprising to see an American actress do number one, period, and number two, a quintessentially French role. She played this smart, embittered old woman very creditably. How will I recognize you when I stumble over you in the park? Your black velvet sugar, I think. In 1999, the 50-year-old proved she could still turn heads when she played a sexy but savage barbarian queen in Titus, a screen version of Shakespeare's play. After tackling Shakespeare, Jessica ventured back onto the stage to play Mary Tyrone in a London revival of Eugene O'Neill's Long Day's Journey into Night. The image that I had of Jessica Lane before I met her was just kind of that of a talented, beautiful movie legend. Kind of, I guess, everybody's image of Jessica Lange. Uh, and then I met her and um, thought, wow, she's really a beautiful, talented movie legend. Jessica received rave reviews and was nominated for an Olivier Award, the British equivalent of a Tony. But after a five-month run, she was impatient to get home to her family. When the play ended, she said, I don't want to do anything for a year. I just want to go home and make sandwiches for the kids and be a mom. Jessica Lang's greatest joy comes from her three children and a union with Sam Shepard that is still going strong after nearly two decades. I think she feels married and she doesn't need a piece of paper to tell her she is. Jessica is definitely a bit of a rebel and likes to do things her way. Jessica's determination to keep her priorities straight has paid off in a deeply satisfying personal life and a successful 25-year career. Her dedication to honestly portraying a wide variety of complex women on screen has earned her two Oscars, the respect of her peers, and made a lasting impression on audiences worldwide. She's not just a movie star. You know, she's a real actress and, and constantly wants to be challenged and, and do interesting work. She can't be easily defined. We haven't been able to pigeonhole her in one place or the other. She's been both sexy and serious. She's a master craftsman. Whatever she does, she does well. If she's a mother, she's a great mother. And if she is acting, she's a great actress. It's just her nature. Well, Jack Nicholson once called her a cross between Bambi and a Buick. And I think that he really nails it. She's extremely strong, well-built, but she's got this incredibly fragile, innocent, shy part of herself as well. That's who she really is, I think, in, in real life. Lang was recently asked to return to the role of Mary Tyrone for the Broadway run of Long Day's Journey in Tonight. Her interest was piqued. But citing scheduling conflicts, she ultimately rejected the part. However, Lang has stated that she's not through with Mary yet, suggesting she may one day reprise what many feel to be the performance of a lifetime.